Good morning. Well, welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. My name is David Edge, and I greet you in the name of our Lord. I'm also your servant in Jesus Christ this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you first that we're having sojourners. This is a Bible study. It's open for anyone who's able to make it, and that's going to be this Thursday uh, at 10 a.m. here in the Fellowship Hall at church here. Uh, next is that we are having an education brunch on March 23rd. Uh, so usually that's the last Saturday of the month, but we're uh, moving it up a little early since that's going to be uh, Easter Saturday, but more on that in just a minute. But first, the uh, education brunch is going to be happening at 9, then at 10.30 we're having the VBS work day. So uh, I think uh, so far, as I'm looking ahead April, it begins. Vacation Bible School prep does. So here it comes, which is great. Uh, and so that we're going to have the work day uh, if you're able to make it. And then also, this is just more of a save the date. But on uh, March 30th, so the, the day before Easter, that we're going to have our community Easter egg hunt that we're going to host here. And so we're trying to get uh, more people, especially new people, uh, to come on out for this. So help us get the word out as you're able to. So March 30th at 10 o'clock, and this is open for everyone. Um, and so that'll be the, the day before Easter. So those are some of the announcements that I have. We do have other events happening. And uh, save the date, so please take a look at your bulletin or the website for more information on that. Also, we're going to have uh, Barbara Bailey. She is the president of the board of directors for HEAT, which is a homeless empowerment action team in Denison. And she's going to present at the end of the service. So once we're done with her last song, she's going to come up and speak for a few minutes. Uh, and so uh, she'll give you some more information of how you can be um, more involved with this and how you can support them, or at the very least, just so you're aware of it, uh, as a resource for anyone who might be in need. Today's uh, topic is uh, the Old Testament lesson, which is Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. And what we're going to see is that uh, God was someone who redeemed his people first, and then after redeeming them, uh, then he brought them uh, not only into the promised land, but gave them instructions on how to live. So likewise, we see that, that we are saved first, and as people who are saved, uh, how is it that we ought to live? And that's going to be summed up in the Ten Commandments. So let's go ahead and rise, greet those around you, then we'll start with our opening songs.
I invite the congregation to please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Though this is a house of prayer, we do not always honor God's house as we should. Still, our Heavenly Father is merciful, and He invites us ever into His house to ask for forgiveness. We take a moment out of silence to reflect upon our own sinfulness and the need for Jesus in our lives. We confess together, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbors. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Disrupt our sinfulness. Forgive us, renew us, and restore us on account of Jesus Almighty God, in his mercy, sent Jesus into our world, not only to disrupt our sinfulness, but also to forgive us by his death and resurrection. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven because of Christ crucified. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to be, to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we get to spend time in God's Word with the first lesson being Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. The Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is in your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, 
It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise out of respect for the words of ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews were at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a a a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered what it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together our common Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, together is worshiped, together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll invite the children forward for the children's message as Miss April is going to lead us. Wait for everybody to get here. Ooh, I like your necklace. Very fancy. Good morning. How are y'all today? Ooh, that was a big yawn. <laughs> oh, it is. We do get tired whenever the weather changes a bit. How many of us like rules? You like rules? There's usually one or two in every group. <laughs> How many of us don't like rules and is willing to admit that we don't like rules? You are? You don't like rules? Bullies don't like rules. Oh, they think rules are meant for breaking? Well, some people do break rules. That's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about why we have rules. Because sometimes they are hard to follow, aren't they? Like, we have rules at school. No hoodies in class is one, yeah. We have... (laughs) Well, we have rules at church, right? We have rules at school. We have rules when we drive. We have rules when we cook things. So you think about what would... Let's think about this for a minute. So when I say I wonder, we're going to talk about what might happen if we didn't have rules, okay? So let's think about on the road. When you drive, there's lots of rules, okay? So some of those rules, like there's traffic lights, stop signs, lights, speed limits, okay? Now, I wonder what would happen if none of those rules existed. There would be crashes. Well, you would probably know how to build cars, but what about how would we know when to stop? How would we know who gets to go first? We wouldn't. Everybody would just go. You'd stop when you felt like it. You'd go as fast or as slow as you wanted to. There'd be, yeah. You could tip your car over. Yeah. There'd be no such thing as a one-way. Everybody could go whichever way they wanted to. So there probably would be a lot of wrecks. Okay, now let's think about school. Wait, about if there were no rules at school, let's see. You'd never have to raise your hand at school. You would never have to be on time. You would never have to have a pencil. You wouldn't have to be respectful. I mean, think what would happen? Would you learn anything? We could be idiots. You'd be, well, I don't know that you would be an idiot, but you might make some crazy choices. I don't need to imagine what that would look like because. Might play on your iPad? Fifth grade's a little tough. But it's like, there's rules, but no one falls. Right? Now, so why do you think, why do you think we have rules? What do you think their purpose is? Raise your hand. And I'll call on you. What do you think the purpose is for rules? Safety. Safety. What else? Peace. Peace. Okay. What else? They stop chaos. They stop chaos. That's true. What else? Nope. Is it about this? Yeah. He lost it. Oh, I know what happens. But you know what? God gave us a set of rules, didn't he? Pastor talked about that earlier. Yes. Because if you're not, like, if you're talking to someone else, and, like, you're not talking to someone It could be distracting, huh? You can't talk and listen at the same time. You cannot talk and listen at the same time. That is absolutely true. Right. Which, so, we have rules here at church. And one of those is, like, when you come up here, is that we focus, Right. So that we can all understand and learn something, right? No, you cannot do that at the same time. But God gave us some rules. And, you know, he gave those to us because he loves us. 
and we talked about how rules can give us safety, they can give us peace, it can avoid chaos, and guess what? All of those rules he gave us do all of those things, okay? Now, I have this bookmark here that you can color, and it's going to help you remember. He gave us something called the Ten Commandments, and Pastor's going to talk about that more in his sermon. So I encourage you to listen while you color and follow through, because he's going to talk about these and talk about why we have them. And it's a time when they had all just come out of Egypt, and you think about what it was like when they were in Egypt. It wasn't the best there was chaos. They probably didn't have a lot of peace, okay? And there wasn't a lot of rules being followed, okay? But they had to learn how to do that once they left. And so he gave them these because he loves them. And we know that he loves us because he wants to keep us safe. And we can know that and trust it because guess what? He sent his son Jesus to keep us safe and to forgive us and save us from our sins so that we have a forever home. So I'm going to give this to you. You can color it. You can write your name on it. Use it in your Bible. I encourage you to know all ten. Okay? So we're going to pray. And then you can go back to your seat, okay? Can you fold your hands for me? Dear God, thank you for giving us rules so that we can be safe, have peace, and be more like you. In your name we pray. Amen. Here you go. Y'all can have these and you can go back to your seat. God had three in one, 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In World War II, to be an airman is one of the more dangerous positions to be in. Uh, For example, uh, this here is uh, future President George H.W. Bush. And you might know that he was a a bomber pilot over in the Pacific Theater. And uh, here he's pictured with his airplane that he nicknamed Barbara III. Barbara named after uh, his sweetheart from back home. And Barbara I uh, crashed in training in Virginia. Barbara II was struck down by some missiles. And so now he's on to Barbara number three already. And, well, September 2nd, 1944, what happened is that he was flying over some of the Pacific Islands on a mission. Anti-aircraft missiles hit. His uh, wings and his uh, engines were on fire. The wings were on fire. Smoke fills the cockpit. But he still continues to fly and is able to hit his target. And then he goes out over the ocean area. And once he makes it clearly onto the water, uh, then he hits the siren to abandon ship. Then the crew parachutes out. Five survive, but at this point they're only in a raft. And they've been sitting there on this raft, and they don't really see too much out there. The only thing they can see and they know are that there are enemy ships that will soon be encircling them. And so they're just completely out there, helpless, if anything, Uh, Not only are they really by themselves on this raft, but it's even worse that some enemy ships are starting to come toward this way. And then all of a sudden, right next to them, a submarine emerges out of nowhere. And later Bush said, well, uh, this thing came out of nowhere, and I just really hope it was one of ours. And fortunately it was. It was the USS Finback, and so uh, there's the crew there. Uh, being rescued, and they were able to get onto the submarine, and they had to go quickly, and then they got down, and as soon as they uh, got into the submarine, that the submarine captain gave them quite a bit of rules. And what happened is that this was uh, a submarine that's on a rescue patrol, and so uh, its job was to go around to rescue the different crews, and once it picked up this one crew, it still had a whole month to go before its mission would be complete. So in other words, that after picking up this one crew, they were not going to completely turn around and go back to base. Instead, they had another month to go. So those who have just been rescued are now part of the crew. And they had to wake up at the same time as their crew wakes up. They all had different jobs to do. Uh, They would eat the food. They would live life now as those So basically, those who have rescued are now working and have life on this submarine. Pastor Michael Ziegler, who's uh, an LCMS pastor and the speaker of Lutheran Hour Ministry, he gave this illustration, and and he was talking about the kind of rules that you would have on a submarine. And this is what he said. He said that, thou shalt not speak above a whisper on the bridge. Thou shalt not slam a hatch in the latrine nor drop a wrench in the engine room, nor clang thy pot in the mess, uh, nor play thy record in the radio room. Why would they have to do this? Well, these are the commandments that they would have to live under uh, now that they are on the submarine. And the reason why is, uh, Pastor Ziegler explains that a submarine, especially when it's near enemy ships, has one main weapon, and that is silence. And while submarines can be well hidden, uh, can be many feet underwater, however, though, sound travels remarkably well. And so that these rules, they might seem kind of random, they almost might seem kind of strict, but they were there so the way the crew would not destroy themselves. And so they had to keep their voice down, that they had to be careful uh, if you're going to play a record. Well, you know, you don't want to be too loud. You don't want to uh, be slamming doors and speaking above a whisper, you know. Uh, I, I don't think my kids would last very long on the submarine, you know. But that's just, that was their life. And so these are the strict commandments, yes, but they had to do this. And what we see is this. Here's a question for you then. These are the rules that they had to live by, and they did. Uh, but did the submarine rescue this crew, uh, this, these airmen? Did the submarine 
rescue them because they followed these rules so good, you know? Was that what they did? Or was it that because this crew was rescued, now they're going to live under these rules? Because, see, the order matters. Again, it's not as if uh, those who were these airmen who parachuted out of this plane and are on these rafts, completely helpless out there, that no amount of strength or no amount of their own logic can be able to deliver them from the situation that they are in. And it's not that the submarine was waiting on them to follow these rules and then maybe they could be rescued, but instead know that since they were rescued, because they were rescued, well, this is how they're going to live. And they're going to do these rules. What about Christianity? Some might think that Christianity is about us maybe following certain rules and maybe once we get our act together and once we do well, and then maybe God will approve of us and maybe we can work our way uh, into God's kingdom. But that's not how Scripture is laid out. That's not the order of the Bible. In fact, when you read the Bible, uh, including the Ten Commandments themselves, let's take a look at those commandments, that it's not simply that God has... Uh, looked at those who would follow the rules the best, and then he's going to save them, but instead that God chose to save them. And then after being saved, now they are going to live in this new life. Let's read our text for today, which is Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3 up here on the screen. Then we'll pray, and then we'll look at some other verses here. So, Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, Out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that you have saved us, not based on our worth, also not based on our works. But Lord, you have chosen to redeem us and save us because you love us. And you give us a way to live. Lord, give us the strength to carry this out. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord our God. Amen. So again, notice the order, even when we talk about the Ten Commandments themselves. So I guess verse 3 is what we would call the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. But notice that the verse before it talks about this, that I am the Lord your God. So it begins with the character of God. I am who I am, Yahweh. I am Yahweh, uh, which is the I am the great Lord, your God, not just any God, but your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So he begins with these 10 words or these 10 commandments, not with, uh, here's something, you got to follow all these like random rules or something, but instead it starts off with that I am the Lord, your God. It starts off with the relationship of who he is and then what he has done for them. And then now that he Uh, has done this for them now that he has rescued them, well, how is it that they should live? Well, of course they should not have any other gods. Why would they, why would you want to have any other gods? And yes, we know what, what gods are. Gods are things that are really idols, things that we worship and we trust and that we put our hope and security in. But why would we want to do that? Because look at what our God has already done for us here. I want to read to you now the, uh, the Ten Commandments. And this is just a, a slightly more modern translation, but listen again to the Ten Commandments. And again, listen to it um, in the way that, uh, in, in the order of things happening. Listen to it again of how God has rescued his people and then he lays out for them his plan on how they ought to live and how we ought to live as well. So Exodus 20, verse 1 to 17. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. There are not to be any other gods for you besides me. You are not to make an idol or form of anything in the heavens above or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You are not to bow down to them, and you are not to serve them, because I am who I am, a jealous God, 
visiting the guilt of the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me and break my commandments, but showing steadfast love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You are not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain because the Lord will not hold guiltless anyone who takes his name, anyone who carries his name as though it were an empty thing. You are to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you will serve and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, a rest day to the Lord. On it you are not to do any work, neither your son nor your daughter, neither your male servant nor your female servant, neither your cattle nor the sojourner who is in the gates. Because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Then he rested on the seventh day, and for this reason, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and set it apart as holy. You are to honor your father and your mother so that your days will be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You are not to murder. You are not to commit adultery. You are not to steal. You are not to give a lying testimony against your neighbor. You are not to crave for yourself your neighbor's house. You are not to crave for yourself your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, or his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. So when you heard these instructions, what is it that you heard? You know, again, sometimes I think we, we think of the Ten Commandments as maybe like this real kind of arbitrary law that it's these, these rules that might seem kind of strict or kind of random. You know, why is it that we need to uh, all of a sudden take a day off of work? I mean, that seems kind of strange, seems, you know, very kind of like backwards and maybe blue laws or something that, you know, previous generations did, but, but we know better now. You know, wouldn't it be better if we just work all the time? I mean, aren't, aren't we better with that, right? You know, uh, or what is it about uh, having no other gods? I mean, why, why is that even important for us? And, um, you know, maybe even something like coveting your, your neighbor's donkey and uh, female servants or male servants. And, you know, I guess if, um, if you have any ox or donkey, I'm probably not going to be all that jealous of you. But I will say, if you guys have some servants, like if you have Downtown Abbey or something, like if you had that, I might be a little jealous of you, you know, just because. That would be kind of nice, I guess. But no, I mean, you know, it just seems odd, admittedly. But again, notice the relationship that God's the one who uh, brought them out of slavery. He didn't ask them if it's okay if he redeems them. No, instead he sent Moses to do this work. And that there he even brought them through, this, through the sea and brought them on dry ground. And then uh, one of my favorite passages is Exodus 15 where Miriam picks up the tambourine and then they, they see the miracle of God and they know that they're being delivered. And so you have one of the highest forms of, of joy and, and worship happens right there. And they start singing that, you know, uh, we shall sing to the Lord our God because he has done mighty things that he has high and lifted up that this is the God who has brought us through, who has uh, taken down those that are mighty but has lifted up those who are weak. And they, they recognize what's happening, and he saves them. And now that he's brought them to this uh, land, and, and now that he is bringing them toward this, and then he encounters them, he invites Moses to go up to this mountain, and then with God's own finger, writes down the way for us to live. And so again, what are these commandments? You know, that they are uh, not just a bunch of, of rules, as if that's what Christianity is really all about. Some religions might be like that. I know some plenty of cults that just have a bunch of random rules to show your loyalty, but that's, that's not really Christianity. Uh, what God is, is expressing here is that he wants us to live in this way because his law is good, that this is his will for our lives, that because he has redeemed you, while you were still a sinner, that Christ has redeemed you. Because he did this, well, how, how should you live? And we, and we don't have to just guess. We don't have to make all this up year after year or generation after generation. But God lays it out. And he, he tells us the way that we ought to live, that now that you have been saved, 
while you were still a sinner, while you've been out there in the life raft, in the raft completely surrounded by enemy ships, completely helpless, knowing that you cannot believe in God with your own reason or with your own strength, completely helpless, that God is the one through his Holy Spirit who's come to you. And what has he done? That he has brought you to his word, that he has brought his word to you. And so because of this, what Christ has done on the cross, forgiving your sins, then well, what, what, why would we want any other God? We know that those are useless anyway, but we have a, a real God who has acted in history. Look, look at what he's done in, in your life, of how he has saved you. And how is it that we ought to talk about God? Well, we should not use his name as if it is uh, emptiness, but instead that we should love his name and his reputation. And, and his, this day, we, we have a whole day where we get to, to worship. As slaves worked all the time and worked long hours every day, but, but now God has given us this day that's an entire gift. And not only rest from our labors, but rest really for our soul. How is it that we're going to uh, respond to those who are in authority, for your parents, your mother, your father, for those who are in authority? Well, we ought to honor them. We ought to respect them. For life itself, that life is such a precious thing for God, that every one of us, he, he knows how many hairs there are on, on, on your heads, and he values your life and your neighbor's life. So how is it that you ought to uphold that? Well, you ought to protect life, all life, and protect your neighbor's well-being, his physical well-being. Uh, you should honor marriage. You should love your spouse. You should honor your, your wife and respect uh, your husband and love deeply your wife. Keep the marriage bed pure, but to not only not commit adultery, but to really love marriage as a symbol of Christ and his church. You should not steal because why would you want to? Trust in God to provide. Look at the ways that he's provided for you. We don't need to be jealous of what other people have. We think about your neighbor's reputation. You don't have to go around slandering them or accusing them of things, but uphold their reputation. And don't be jealous about other things. Why would we want to be jealous? Because again, look at what God has given us. So we think about these Ten Commandments that this is all done in relationship to God. And after having been rescued, we get to not like obey him as if we have to in some kind of new enslavement. But no, this is, this is freedom. This is what it means to be free in Christ. This is how God wants us to live. This is his will for our lives. And again, this is all done because we have been redeemed it's not simply that God waits for us to be perfect and to fulfill the law, but instead we have this. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You and I know what it's like to be out there on this life raft, to be completely abandoned or to be completely helpless. And yet we're, we cannot come in and save ourselves. We know that um, the only thing out there is just the enemy ships starting to encircle us and get closer to us. And yet, in this time, though, we have Christ who has showed up. We have Christ who has come to us. And now that we have been rescued, well, we should live. And we'll, we'll live in the way that he has designed for us. Friends, we have life after he has rescued us. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll go now to our offering. So for those that consider this your church home, that uh, we now get to give sacrificially to our God. Again, not that it saves us, but this is what God calls us to do uh, as we uh, help the ministry here at this congregation. We'll also use this as a time to prepare our hearts for the prayer of the church.
Lord Jesus Christ, lead your church on earth to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Disrupt our petty preferences and cultural biases so that we might welcome people from every nation, language, and background. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you delivered the people out of slavery in Egypt and taught them how to live as your people. So teach us to live according to your righteous instructions so that we may live peacefully with you and with our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, Lord Jesus Christ, you were well acquainted with grief and death. Bring comfort to all of those who are suffering in grief, especially for the family of Josie, the 13-month-old who passed away unexpectedly and had their funeral last Wednesday. Lord, we ask that you can wrap your arms around this grieving family and know them and let them know that you have plans for them and that you still love them. Also for prayers for the family of Emmett Atten as he also passed away this week. We ask that you can point all of those who are grieving to the hope that is in your father's house, that there are many rooms, and that you have gone to prepare a place for us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, intercede for all those struggling with relationship issues, whether in friendships, family dynamics, marital struggles, or relationships within the church. We pray that you would bring repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation in the midst of such struggle. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, look with favor upon all who are sick, injured, and recovering, especially for those that we name silently in our hearts now. In our special prayers, we want to uplift Craig Strum for continued healing for him. Also for Kelly Gilbert, we ask that you can keep him and other truck drivers safe while they are traveling across the country. We pray for all the athletes this season. Lord, we ask that they can do well and they can bring honor to you through their games. For Steve Magnuson, also for Steve Robertson and Elaine Dawson. Lord, you know their needs. We also pray for Dawn, who's having a knee replacement. And so, Lord, we ask that she can heal well, as well as for Penny, who's also recovering, as well as for Regina, who's been recovering from a surgery as well. We also pray for all the chaplains at TMC and other hospitals, that they can be faithful to your word. And bring comfort to those in need. We also pray for Jonah's leg. That it can fully heal. Lord we thank you that he got his cast off. But we ask that he can continue to uh, walk. And have good physical therapy. For Paul Velton. Who has knee surgery on Thursday. Lord we ask for a speedy recovery for him. And finally for those who have lost their homes. And livelihood in the Texas Panhandle fires. Lord, we ask that you can protect their property and that through the church and through charity organizations, restore what they have lost. For these and these other things, Lord, we lift them all before you and we lift them in the name of your son, our Lord. And we pray as he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. We pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you will strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just uh, before we go, just a quick reminder that we're going to have Barbara Bailey of Heat. She's going to talk uh, after this closing song, and so be sure to stick around, and she'll also be available for any comments or questions. Now we go with God's peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. All right. So I invite the praise team forward as we'll sing the Lamb as our closing song. Thank you.
And now uh, we'll have uh, Barbara Bailey can come on up. And so Barbara is the president of the board of directors for Homeless Empowerment Action Team in Denison. She's also one of the founding uh, members of the organization and is someone who continues to work in the organization. So uh, Barbara's going to tell us about the ministry and how we can be involved. Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, HEAT, as you see on that slide, is a nonprofit organization called the Homeless Empowerment Action Team. And we've been uh, operating as a nonprofit for five years. And what we've learned over the five years is that the homeless will only change when they're ready to change. You know, we worked with a couple before for about a year and a half got them into employment. They worked in a, in a really good paying job for about three weeks and then quit and went back to their ways. So until they're ready to move, we can't move them. But we have also learned that there's an awful lot of low income people that need some direction, that live not even paycheck to paycheck, that have to make decisions every month about whether I'm gonna pay this bill get a prescription filled or whatever. And we can direct those people as well to agencies that can help them. On this next slide, you're going to possibly see a couple familiar looking faces. Uh, part of our founding group uh, was made up of Robert, Robin and April Gilbert. And even Steve served at our mobile shower unit that came up once a week and served, uh, we had a mobile shower behind First Christian Church in Denison that gave showers weekly. The building you see up there is Center Cross Soup Kitchen, which has been in operation for seven years. Uh, and you can see the, the people that come to the soup kitchen are really low income people more so than homeless people. Denison probably only has a population of 20 people that live on the street. Uh, but there's an awful lot of people that are living in cars, uh, living in a house with 12 people in that house, or that couch surf, you know, and go different places that need our services. We partnered with Center Cross uh, to help try to have a one-stop uh, nonprofit that could help people and not have them have to wonder where to go. Uh, we direct people to uh, Texoma Family Shelter, Family Promise, uh, Master Keys Ministry for Food, the Texoma Council of Governments for weatherization and electricity needs, etc. So we're trying to link people up with services that they have a need for. It's not our job to fix people, to change people, to judge people. It's our job to love people, and the rest is in God's hands. You know, we've trusted in God for this for the last five years, and he has blessed us in many, many ways. When we started off with this ministry, uh, we had a very adversarial relationship with the city of Denison. They were very fearful that we were go going to grow the homeless population by giving them nice things, giving them a shower, giving them clean underwear and t-shirts and stuff. And we met with the city of Denison for six months, and finally, God turned things around. Instead of being an adversary with the city, the city invited us to uh, apply for a community development block grant and gave us $80,000. Now, if that isn't God at work, I don't know what is. He also has worked with us over the, the five years and as far as helping us to find an architect and a general contractor, as you know, that can cost tens of thousands of dollars. And, and our two people that we had only wanted to cover their expenses and they did everything else pretty much pro bono for us. Uh, God gave us and blessed us with six, six different foundation and grant funding to complete the construction of this building. He sent uh, subcontractors our way that would donate their services or give us uh, a vent hood at cost and you know they'd put it in with the labor so he's continuously shown us 
that he's with us in this process and that he wants us to be where we're at. Here's a picture of what our building looks like right now. Uh, the top left is uh, the dining hall. If you look down the, the hall, it's a, it's a long uh, built, you know, open concept of the dining hall. And then you can see the laundry facilities down there. You can see the showers. It's going to house three different showers that are in this facility. This is the soup kitchen. The soup kitchen and heat are actually two different nonprofits. Instead of going our own way, we try to partner with agencies so that we can be that one-stop shop, so to speak, to help people and make them not have to hunt around as much. Plus, it gives us the flexibility to be able to also share the expenses of the building and not have duplicate overhead expenses for the facility. This is what the building looks like today. Uh, we had an inspection last week and had a couple items red tagged as needing to be corrected. So we will be re-inspected next week and hopefully after that we will physically be in this building. Like I mentioned before, uh, Center Cross actually serves 60 to 70 people on a daily basis. So the need is great that's there. You know, what God has taught us over these four years is one, be patient, two, wait on his timing, and his timing is so different than ours. Uh, so patience is definitely a requirement. Uh, but we're at a, a point right now where, you know, the, the building and the construction is done, it's paid for. Now we have operating expenses that we need to partner with our church community and individuals in the community to help to try to cover a thousand dollars of expenses that we have. So we're looking for individuals or churches that will partner with us to cover those expenses. Grace Lutheran, you have helped us in the past. You have helped to build this building with your contributions to Heat, and we thank you and 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 bless God for you know sending you our way. Uh, we just pray that you might consider joining us in this monthly ministry, joining us as prayer partners in this ministry, that God will use it in a mighty way, that he will give us the boldness to be able to witness to people that need God to turn their lives around, not us as people, but God. Uh, and there are also volunteer opportunities. You know, we need people that can just help work with us as we are giving showers. You know, we hand out T-shirts and underwear and socks and things like that. And we're going to try to get the, the people, instead of throwing away things, to do laundry. Now, that's a, that's a big ask. We'll see how that works. That's yet to be seen. But again, I just want to thank Grace Lutheran for being our partner in the past. Uh, I'm going to leave some brochures with the church and stuff. This will tell you a little bit more about who, who we are, what our journey has been. It will give you some information on uh, what you can do to partner with HEAT. It's got my phone number on there if you need more information and want to call. Well, thank you, Barbara. And uh -huh. She'll be available afterwards, like I said, and, and we have some brochures as well if you like one. So thank you all. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.